In 2016, I made a tutorial on how to transfer VHS to digital video. Despite this channel being dedicated to vintage computing, that tutorial remains my most successful video to date. But a lot has happened since then. There's better software available that can do everything necessary in one step. So I figured it was time to make a new tutorial. Now, there are dozens of tutorials online for transferring VHS, so why is it worth your time to watch this one? Well, other tutorials usually produce an okay result that looks like this. But if analog video is processed properly, it can look like this. If the example on the right looks better and smoother than the example on the left, then this tutorial is for you. I'll cover cheap capture hardware I've tested that works well, and show you how to set up the software to perform one-click recording. But most importantly, I'll explain the critical secret necessary to preserve analog video's true frame rate. So, here's what we'll cover in this tutorial. First, I'll explain the scope of this tutorial and who it's for. Next, I'll explain the secret to transferring video properly that practically everyone, even online streaming services, gets wrong. I'll show several capture devices I tested successfully and where to get them. I'll walk you through downloading, installing, and configuring the free software we're going to use. Finally, I'll go over some common troubleshooting steps if you run into something unexpected. If you know some of this already, use the chapter markers in this video's description to skip past sections you don't care about. Now, this tutorial is a bit out of place on my channel, which is supposed to be dedicated to the topic of vintage personal computing. So to stay on brand for this channel, I've picked some appropriate source material to use today. Yeah, we're going there. This tutorial has a very specific scope. It's meant for beginners who have never tried this process before. When finished, it's a one-step process that creates good quality files that work for most use cases. It also tries to be as cheap as possible. It uses free software, doesn't require a powerful computer, and you should be able to follow along spending less than $50. To keep things simple for beginners, I won't be covering advanced topics in this tutorial. Real-time conversion, such as upscaling and HDMI output, is not covered. This tutorial is about capturing video to digital files, not connecting VCRs to modern televisions. Also, this tutorial does not produce preservation-grade archival masters. Archival masters require more expensive equipment and a more complicated workflow. And finally, this tutorial does not go into video restoration, such as noise removal or 4K upscaling. I might cover these advanced topics at a later date if there's interest. Leave a comment if you'd be interested in learning about them. To produce the best quality results, we've got to take a minute to explain the critical secret necessary for smooth output, and that is the difference between frames and fields. Analog video is captured in frames per second, but an analog video frame is not a single image. It actually hides two images, captured at different moments in time. See those horizontal jagged lines? One image is contained in the even lines of the frame, the other image is in the odd lines. These two images are called fields, and they are interlaced together in a single frame. This is why you may have heard analog video referred to as interlaced video. This property of interlaced video means that we can create a smooth 60 frames per second output by separating each field into its own image. The end result should look identical to how a VHS tape actually looks when played on a VCR. Capture hardware can cost anywhere from 10 bucks to thousands of dollars, so what should you buy? We need both fields in our capture to get the best quality, so the main criteria, no matter the cost, is any capture hardware that passes both fields through unharmed. Sadly, most cheap $10 USB capture devices don't do this. Their drivers only capture one field, so there's no way to get a decent result using them. Here's two examples of devices to avoid. On Amazon, their brand name is DigitNow, but the same devices are sold under many different names and are usually shaped exactly like this. Luckily for you, I tested many USB capture dongles to see which ones passed both fields through, had halfway decent drivers, and were still available for sale. The winners are the IOData GV-USB2. This is popular with retro console gamers who stream over Twitch. It has a great driver with many options and is still sold commercially for about $50. Don't let the Japanese documentation scare you away. You can find a link to the latest Windows driver in this video's description. 
The StarTech, get ready for this, SVID to USB 232. This adapter works fine, but it's the least recommended of the bunch because it required some tweaking of contrast levels. This can be inconvenient, but it's not a showstopper. It's available brand new for roughly $40. The Dazzle DVC100. Yes, this is the same device I featured in my previous video. It's still my favorite because it's more tolerant of timing issues than other devices. It hasn't been sold for over a decade, but you can usually find them on eBay for around $20. However, if you get one, make sure it says hardware version 1.1, as I haven't tested other versions. For links on where to find these devices, check this video's description. And for a used Dazzle device, you can check eBay. For software, all we need is the excellent and free Open Broadcaster Software, or OBS. OBS has come a very long way in the past seven years since I did my original tutorial and is capable of capturing, processing, and encoding all in a single step. Let's download and install it now. Okay, gonna go off script here and get things started. First off, let's uh, download OBS. So OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, is obtained from obsproject.com. If you do a search, you may find that uh, other websites will have it listed, but this is the official location. And once you're here, you download uh, the version for what you'll be using. Um, this tutorial is on Windows, so we're going to download the Windows version. Okay, once you've got it downloaded and installed, go ahead and start it up. I'll do so here in Windows. And you'll be greeted with a multi-pane interface. And it's this isn't a full OBS tutorial, but it's worth explaining at least a couple of sections. Uh, this section up here is called the scene. And it is essentially a big canvas that you can put multiple elements on. This whole rectangle becomes the video that you're recording or streaming or capturing. Uh, some people like to put a little uh, corner of themselves uh, down here, like a little webcam or something, and then the, the thing they're presenting or the game they're streaming here, and some other stuff. But we're only going to be putting uh, one giant VHS capture on the scene, so we're only going to have one element in it. Uh, speaking of which, sources are elements that go into the scene. So we will be adding sources here, most importantly video capture device, but let's get to that a little later. Uh, and then finally over here in controls, uh, we have uh, settings for setting up, uh, well, our settings, uh, what we're recording and how we're going to be saving it. And then of course, starting and stopping recording. So let's start with a, a set of defaults. Um, first of all, if we're gonna be monitoring uh, how our capture is doing, we should turn on some statistics. So go to Docs and pick Stats. And you should see uh, a docked stats window show up. It will show the capture rate, it'll show uh, how many frames it has captured uh, or missed or skipped and so on. And this will come in handy later, but for now it's, it's enough that it's simply enabled. Now we're going to create a new profile a profile is a settings group for OBS, and uh, we're going to create a new one because it sets a lot of the settings to default, and I want that for this tutorial because then it's less for us to change. Let's just call this uh, VHS capture for the profile. Okay, and as you'll and you'll notice that the window got wider because it set the default to its default, which is a widescreen image. Uh, now let's go ahead and create a new scene collection uh, just to make things clear and clean uh, so that if you're using OBS with other things, for example, that your scene won't, uh, uh, you know, conflict with other scenes. So again, we're gonna, just going to call this VHS. It's a VHS scene. Okay, and you should notice down here that uh, we have a single scene, which is fine. And now we can configure OBS for what we're going to be doing. We need to set the size of this canvas to be a 4x3 canvas that is appropriate for VHS capture. Uh, a lot of people sometimes will capture into a widescreen and they'll try to stretch it. That looks odd, so we're not going to do that. But we do need to tell OBS we want a 4x3 screen. To do that, we're going to do settings. And then video is where we define the properties of the canvas and how it's output. For both of these, we're going to pick a 4x3 
1080p resolution, which is 1440 by 1080. And you're going to put 1440 by 1080 in both of these. And since we want our output to be the full 60 fields per second, for common FPS values, for NTSC we want 59.94. If you're in a PAL region, you can pick 50 for PAL, but for us, we want 59.94. And hit OK. Now you'll see that our canvas has been resized to what we need. At this point, it's good to start your source playing so that you have a signal to uh, examine when you hook up your capture device. So go ahead and put your tape, uh, any tape at all, into a VCR and start it playing. And uh, that will be our test signal for when we're starting the next step. So naturally, at this point, go ahead and connect the video and audio leads from your VCR to your capture device. Uh, typically, the video connection, if you're using composite video, is yellow. And if you have a left and a right audio lead, typically the red is the right side. So red is right. It's easy to remember. With everything connected up, you're ready to add a video source. So go to the Sources panel, hit the plus sign, and pick Video Capture Device. You can name it if you want, but it's not really necessary. Just hit OK. And then you will be provided with a window for your video source. Now, the first thing you have to do is pick your actual capture device. I actually have several on this system, so we don't see anything. So I'm going to drop down and pick the device I have inserted, which is the GV-USB2. And it should pop straight up. Uh, this is our video test source here. And uh, hopefully it's going to look just fine. However, if you need to make some adjustments, if you're not seeing something, you can configure the video. And what that will do is it'll bring up the driver for the driver interface for your capture device. And you can adjust some properties. We'll go ahead and start with the GV-USB2 just so you can see what it looks like. And I'll show you the, how the, the pop-up for this for the other devices. Um, for the GV-USB2, you generally don't have to change any of these settings, but you do have to make sure that it is set to weave. And what that means is it will not attempt any deinterlacing. It will pass all of the fields through untouched. There are some other settings here too. Uh, also, such as, for example, a proc amp, which you can use to try to um, adjust brightness and contrast. I usually just leave these at whatever the defaults are. To show you an example of what that configuration dialog may look for other devices, let's go ahead and pick the StarTech device. Uh, the StarTech device is shows up as USB 2828. When you do that, now I've paused the video here, so don't be alarmed. It's not, uh, the capture device is working just fine, but I've gone ahead and paused because I want to show something you may need to adjust when you configure the video on this device. This device, for some reason, has incorrect levels. Uh, you may notice that the some of these areas are blown out and they don't look right. If you reduce the contrast level to the point where the blooming goes away and nothing is blown out, then it looks fine. And this number, contrast 20, actually does match with my own settings uh, that I've tested before. So sometimes you have to adjust the image, which you can do so in the driver uh, settings when you configure video. Let's go ahead and check the Dazzle device so you can see what that configuration dialog looks like. So let's go ahead and pick the Dazzle device, uh, which conveniently shows up as the Dazzle DVC-100. We still have our paused video frame here as a signal. If you configure video on this, uh, you, have, you don't have very many options. Um, sometimes uh, on some of these dialogs you'll see a VCR input uh, toggle, which I believe is supposed to handle either better timing or something, but I've never found this to actually do anything, so it's okay to leave it. The Dazzle also has some proc amp controls. Uh, if you need to, you can adjust things. However, the defaults produce a perfect image, so we don't need to do anything there. Once you've connected your capture device and you see that you've definitely got an image, go ahead and click OK and that will set the video capture device uh, to your device. And you should also see audio coming in, if it's connected correctly, over in the audio mixer section. 
and this is good. This is what we want to see. Now that we have our video capture device putting something into our scene, let's go ahead and set our recording settings, our file compression settings, and do a test capture just to make sure that everything is working as it looks like it's working. So for that, we go to the lower uh, right to controls and to settings, and then to output. If you're not an expert in OBS, keep the output mode simple. We are not streaming, so we ignore the streaming settings. Go down to recording. First, pick a location for where your saved files are going to be. I'm going to go ahead and pick a temporary directory on my E drive. You can pick anywhere you like. For recording quality, we have a couple of options. High quality, indistinguishable, and lossless. We All we need is high quality. Don't pick indistinguishable or lossless because these create much larger files and they won't have any better quality for our source material which is a VHS tape. So just pick high quality medium file size. For recording format, the most compatible format across all devices and software is MP4 out of that list, so pick MP4. And for encoder, you may have software only options, you may also have some hardware options. So what you should pick if you don't have hardware options is software x264 low CPU preset so I don't know what kind of computer you have if you have an old computer that is slow you definitely need this setting uh, if you have a fast computer like something made after the year 2020 you can pick software x264 if you have uh, any Intel chipset with uh, quick sync video you could pick that, and that will offload. It'll do the encoding in hardware, which will offload from the CPU. If you have an NVIDIA card like I do, you can pick hardware NVIDIA encoding, H.264, and that will also offload from the CPU. But for this test, if you have no idea what to do, pick the low CPU usage preset. And then click OK. And now that we've set our basic settings. Now I know that this doesn't look correct, but what we want to do is just simply test, do a test recording to make sure that everything is working. So for that, we go down to controls and we click start recording. And we are doing a recording now. This should light up blue to show you it's recording. If we go down to our stats, we should see these numbers increasing occasionally, which they are and we should also have let's resize this a little bit we can see the total data that's being output into our file and what the average bitrate is and that's it we just need a couple of seconds for testing so go ahead and stop recording and then go ahead and pull up that file and and see if it works now let's go ahead and minimize obs real quick and go to the location where I saved that temp where I saved my test file and I'm going to double click it to play it to make sure that it plays okay and it is playing just fine so we've made a successful test recording now we need to finish setting up OBS completely now that we know we can record and play back correctly with OBS let's go ahead and finish setting up this scene so that the video looks the way we want it to Remember earlier how I demonstrated analog video contains two fields per frame? We need to tell OBS how to correctly interpret that. So to do that, go to your video capture device setting, right click, and then pick de-interlacing. And you have lots of options here because the correct de-interlacing for any interlaced output is two times the speed. We want to pick one of these 2x settings. The best one here is Yadif 2x. It stands for yet another deinterlacer. Uh, it has uh, what it does is it tries to analyze one frame ahead and behind and make intelligent decisions based on that. So use Yadif 2x, and you don't have to worry about these field settings just yet. So once we do that, the output should now be a smooth 60 frames per second. To better illustrate that, let's go ahead and resize the capture to fit our entire canvas. And to do that, we want to go right click again, do transform, and do stretch to screen. 
And now there's the full stretch. And then we can also increase the quality of the stretch by right clicking and doing scale filtering and picking uh, Lanchos. I believe it's pronounced that way. I'm not Hungarian, so forgive me if it's wrong. And what that will do is produce a nice smooth scroll. To prove that we're interpreting fields correctly, let's rewind the tape a little bit and go to a section with a lot of motion. Well, this certainly has a lot of motion in it, and as you can tell, it's definitely smoother. So this is the output that will essentially be sent directly to the file. This is the full scene, this is what OBS sees, and now you can go ahead and do your full recording. Go ahead and start recording. And it might be good to do yet another test, uh, like do a couple of seconds of recording and then go ahead and check the file, which actually I'll go ahead and do here. I'll stop recording and once again, bring up the temporary location where I have these files. Now you'll see that OBS saves these in date stamp format, which is great, which means they sort naturally and you also can see by the file name when they were recorded. Let's go ahead and try this new test recording. And I'll go ahead and make this full screen. So we're all set to record and now you are set to record. Go ahead and rewind your tape to the beginning, go back into OBS, start recording, and you should be good to go. As easy as that was, you might encounter some issues along the way. Here are some answers to common problems. If you're dropping frames because the CPU load is too high, you can shrink the size of the captured video. Instead of 1440 by 1080, you can choose 960 by 720. This won't look as good if you upload the result to YouTube because YouTube gives less bitrate to 720p videos, but it's always a better choice not to drop frames. If that doesn't help, you might need to upgrade your PC. Any PC or Mac made after the year 2010 should work for this process without dropping frames. If you're dropping frames even if the CPU load is low, then this might be caused by timing issues, such as an old stretched out VHS tape, poor over-the-air recording quality, recordings made at the slow 6-hour SLP speed, or dirty VCR heads. There's not much you can do about tape or recording problems, but you can clean the VCR heads with a cleaning tape to see if it gets better. There are also more thorough ways to clean VCR heads. I've left a few links on how to do so in this video's description. If that doesn't help, then you might need to introduce a piece of hardware that enforces good timing signals called a time base corrector, or TBC. Many SVHS decks come with one built in, or you can get a standalone TBC unit and put it in between the VCR and the capture device. Unfortunately, both options cost a lot of money and are out of scope for this beginner's tutorial. Some combinations of video capture devices, drivers, and operating systems can sometimes result in no audio signal coming from the capture device. This can be very difficult to troubleshoot. But if your computer has another way of capturing audio, such as an audio line in port or dedicated audio interface, you can use that for capturing the audio. Just add an audio source in OBS and pick your audio capture device. OBS will combine both sources during the recording process. If the finished video has audio that drifts out of sync, you might be dropping too many frames. See the previous troubleshooting tips to address that. Audio sync problems might be fixable by adjusting an audio offset value in OBS. I've put links in this video's description to some troubleshooting videos that try to address that. OBS defaults to recording in stereo. If the audio in your capture is only coming out of the left or right side, there are two common causes. If your VCR or camcorder only has one output jack, you can use a cheap mono to stereo adapter to send the audio to both left and right inputs. If the stereo playback itself is only coming out one side, because it was originally recorded that way, you can tell OBS to treat the signal as mono. At the recording source, choose Advanced Audio Properties, then check the Mono checkbox to mix both channels into mono. If the resulting output video looks consistently jittery or jumpy, as if the frames are playing out of order, 
then the field order might be swapped. To fix this, right-click your video capture device in the Sources section, go to Deinterlacing, and try the other Field First setting. And that's it! I hope you found this tutorial helpful, especially the part about how to deinterlace analog video correctly to a 60p target. What did you think? Is there something I left out that a beginner's tutorial should have covered? Leave your questions and comments below. If you liked this video, you might be interested in another video I did about how I clean videotapes covered in mold so that you can capture them without damaging your equipment. And of course, if you're interested in vintage computing in the early days of the IBM PC, check out my entire channel.